Hi folks, welcome to lesson eight of resource management. Uh, we're going to kick straight off with an image here. This is a photograph that has been taken looking down onto the Earth's surface. Do you know what it is? Think about that for a second. It's pretty spectacular. It's not been made up, it is real. These in fact are irrigation circles. In other words, uh, farmers have watered the land using sprinkler systems and that is the pattern that has been created. When I did a, a quick Google search on irrigation circles, that's what came up on Google Images. Um, so these are all real photographs. And um, I mean, having flown over some of these areas of the world, um, it is pretty spectacular looking out the windows and looking down. In fact, if you look at the bottom picture on the very left hand side, there is a picture of an aeroplane wing looking down onto the land and the farmer has obviously um, made the apple logo sign out of it and by the looks of it the green one next to it is the shell sign so even the farmers have been quite creative with their um, harvesting of their crops um, pretty spectacular the bottom right picture shows you one of those sprinkler systems it's called a pivot irrigation system so it's sort of uh, moves round in circles, watering the land on that particular patch, and then everything grows and creates those circles. Pretty spectacular. Um, if we zoom further out and we actually take an image from space, that's what it looks like. So these irrigation circles can be seen from space. Really impressive. So I thought we'd kick off with that as the uh, start to our lesson, um, because we're looking at food supply and how we can increase it. That's one of the irrigation systems at ground level. So looking at it there doesn't look that impressive, does it? And then when you look at it from above, it really is quite amazing. So we're looking at strategies for increasing food production and you need to have an overview of how the following things can improve food supply. So we'll be looking at irrigation. That's uh, we've just touched on it, really. Aeroponics and hydroponics something called the new green revolution, the use of biotechnology and appropriate technology. And that's what we're learning about today. I suggest you write that title down in your book and then um, you can get going. And to start off with, let's look at irrigation as the first strategy. Irrigation is simply watering the land. We've just talked a little bit about it with the picture on the top left, which shows you that high tech sprinkler system. But the picture on the top right shows you a watering can. That is still irrigation. It's just low technology. So irrigation is needed in countries where there is a dry season and a shortage of water. So where there is water scarcity um, and they can extract water from rivers or from under the ground and water the land. Um, so you've got two examples there, one that's more high tech and one that's more low, low tech. The picture on the bottom right and the bottom left that's also irrigation. The, um, it's called drip irrigation and the white container that you can see with the man stood in front of it, that stores the water and then it's piped through those almost looks like hose pipes um, across the fields and they have tiny holes in them and throughout the day very small amounts of water will be dripped out over the crops. The, the family in the bottom right, it looks like they're planting their seedlings alongside those pipes where the holes are. Um, so it's very efficient because not much water is wasted uh, because it goes directly to the roots of the plant. So these are all examples of irrigation um, and it can be on a number of scales. So <clears throat> this picture here is a dam that has been made across a river and behind that dam is a huge reservoir full of water. And they create these dams and reservoirs in order to then make channels that will go from that reservoir um, to different parts of the country. Um, that will then you know supply the water to be able to use to be used for irrigation so that would be a very expensive project unlike the watering can that you saw in the previous image um, this is a nice example actually the Indus Basin irrigation system is a really good example of a system that's been introduced into Pakistan so if you look at the map there Pakistan is um, the kind of orangey color being highlighted in the orangey color You've got India to the right, Afghanistan to the um, to the west, China to the north and the Himalayan mountains and the rivers that supply the Indus River 
come from China, Nepal um, and Afghanistan really and, and they pass through, they all connect and pass through Pakistan when they go out into the Arabian Sea. So lots of dams have been put across that river um, and loads of reservoirs have been made and it's brought a lot of food production to that area of the world. Um, this map's actually it might look confusing to you, but in the, the white line that you can see going all the way around is showing you the actual basin. So any rainwater falling inside of that will end up in those uh, rivers and will pass through the country out into the Arabian Sea. The blue lines are showing you the rivers. The green lines that you can see on there are showing you the irrigation channels that have been built. So those channels have been man dug, if you like, to connect to the rivers. So all that area that you can see uh, where you've got loads of green canals, they are all being used to um, extract water from. And they're being fed by the Indus River, the main Indus River. Um, and it allows for commercial farming. So looking at this image here, the two photographs on the, the bottom right and the one in the middle, those are massive farms. Um, and you can see the water that's being channeled down them, um, constantly watering those crops. And it's, it's allowed for a huge amount of food production. In fact, you can see the one on the bottom left, you can see almost the edge of where they are irrigating because the land in the distance and on the, uh, the far right of the image is almost desert-like. And then you've got that green, nice lush green area where they've clearly been irrigating. The map is showing you um, what you've already seen on the previous slide, only it's a slightly simp simpler version. So the red squares are showing you um, the barrages. This is essentially where they put the dams and the reservoirs are the green circles that have been created so all of those will be piping water across the whole of this region of Pakistan and probably uh, parts of Afghanistan, India, China as well. These are large scale projects, very, very expensive to make dams and reservoirs and pipe water. Um, and usually uh, they would benefit commercial farms. Commercial farms are farms when you're, you're farming on a massive scale and you're um, selling it. So you're exporting whatever it is you're growing, and you're making a lot of money from it. So it kind of benefits um, wealthier business people, I would say, rather than small farmers. And that's just an image showing you the extent of some of the irrigation um, and the crops being grown. Okay, little task for you, please. Could you write the subtitle irrigation? in your book and then copy down the definition that is above. When you've done that, so pause this uh, part of the uh, clip and then when you've done that, move on. Okay, so you've got the general idea of how irrigation works. Now let's look at a real life example. So we're going to focus on Senegal, which is a country in Africa, and they have set up an irrigation project in order to be able to water the land to be able to grow more food. And as you know, many African countries have a, um, a food deficit. So it's essential that they can boost production for the future. What I'd like to do is pause this slide, go to the YouTube clip using the link as shown, um, watch the clip and answer the six questions that you can see there in front of you. And the answers to those questions I have put right at the end of this video. Once you've done that, move on. Another strategy of boosting food supply is something called aeroponics and hydroponics. And this really blows my mind because I can tell you now that you can grow a lettuce in 24 hours using this kind of technique, which is just incredible, really. I mean, if I asked you to go and grow a lettuce in your garden, you might be looking at a couple of months um, if you're going to start from growing the seed and, uh, and harvesting the lettuce. And you'd be out there watering it and, you know, hoping for warm conditions, ideal for growing. But to actually be able to grow one in artificial conditions in 24 hours is simply incredible. 
And the Japanese do a lot of hydroponics and aeroponics. So what is it? Uh, the definitions tell you there what it is. So aeroponics is growing plants in an air or mist environment without the use of soil. So uh, the image on the bottom left is showing you plants stacked up vertically and they are just um, they're just the roots are dangling through holes and they are totally open to the air. And in this greenhouse, they will be spraying a constant mix of it's very, very fine mist of water. And in that water will be the perfect concentration of nutrients that those plants need. And so they're literally taking it out of the air and growing and they'll be growing probably under artificial lighting as well which tricks the plant into thinking that it's daytime even when it's nighttime so they can constantly be growing very very clever hydroponics is very similar uh, it's a method of growing plants using mineral nutrient solutions in water but without soil so they'll be sat like the top picture that you can see there in those pipes there will be a layer of water it will have perfect amount of nutrients in it and the plants just simply sit in that water and grow there's no soil needed because i mean really when you think about farming in the uk the reason we plant things in the ground is because the nutrients are in the soil but if you can um, create a a water-like mixture of perfect nutrients perfect concentration then they can be contained in these pipes and they can feed the plants. It's very, very efficient. Um, a little experiment for you. If you were to go into the garden and, um, I don't know, snip one of your mum's best plants <laughs> and put it in a little cup of water on the kitchen windowsill, you would probably notice after about a week or two, you'd start to see roots growing on the bottom of the tip and you could probably continue to grow the plant in a cup on the windowsill just with water and maybe adding in a little bit of um, like a, a plant growth mix and you wouldn't need any soil. It's incredible. So a little, little tip for you, you could always give that a go. Right, task. Could you please write the subtitle aeroponics and hydroponics that down those two definitions so you'll need to pause this slide and then when you've done that unpause so we can move on right um i'd like you to watch both of these clips they're only a few minutes long each um it talks through it in a bit more detail and probably better than i have so uh, listen to each of those clip clips and answer the following two questions one i want you to be able to describe how it works to increase food, food supply and two Create a, uh, two columns in your book, an advantages and a disadvantages, and see if you can listen out for uh, the different advantages and disadvantages of these methods. Um, you'll get some from the clips. You might think of things yourself as well, so put those down. And if you are really interested, you could do a little bit of research online to see whether you can find even more advantages and disadvantages. All the answers to the questions um, my ideas will be at the end of this uh, video. Another way of boosting food production is biotechnology. So you could write that down as a subtitle and write the definition out. To explain what it is, um, I think actually if you look at the photographs, it, it tells you quite nicely. Look at those um, bananas, picture at the top left. The ones on the right hand side are showing you a genetically modified way of making bananas and the ones on the left haven't been genetically modified and so it looks like they are rotting slightly. The photographs of the carrots at the bottom, you've got wild carrots on the left hand side that have been grown, they have not been modified in any way. And the ones on the right have been, that's what you're used to buying. Uh, nice and uh, look like good shape don't look diseased at all, look really healthy. We've got the tomatoes. You've got a picture of a non-genetically modified tomato and one that has been. And I think instantly the question there says, what's the difference? Well, you can see the difference. One's a lot bigger than the other. Um, so again, that's a way of boosting food supply. You've got the corn, top right. Uh, the picture at the bottom, that's the one that I'm sure you'd choose to eat. Well, that's the one that's been genetically modified. The one above hasn't. 
um, and the tomatoes, the, the picture of the three sets of tomatoes, that's showing you ordinary tomatoes after 10 days, then after 20 days, and then after 45 days. And look what happens to them, the rate of deterioration. You certainly wouldn't want to eat those. Whereas the gene silenced ones have been genetically modified. So even after 45 days, they look quite edible, don't they? So these foods have been genetically modified. And interestingly, uh, the bottom right picture, which shows you the carrots, that tells you that 80% of our food that we eat has been genetically modified. And that's basically what biotechnology is. It's, um, it's, it's modifying food so that we can grow a bigger yield. We can change the way it tastes. We can change the way it, um, we, we can make it pest resistance. So it doesn't, so diseases and pests don't damage it. We can make it tolerant of really cold conditions so it can still grow in the cold. We can make it tolerant of hot conditions and of dry conditions. We can change and manipulate the, um, the plant in order to grow as, as efficiently as we want. Anything in life can be, anything that's living in life can be genetically modified. Um, even animals can be genetically modified. Um, and we can do it with food as a way of boosting production. It's actually quite controversial. Uh, some people would say, you know, that we don't really understand the disadvantages that it can have on the environment and on human health, because obviously we're eating it. Um, so it's quite controversial. And in the UK, we don't tend to uh, genetically modified, uh, genetically modify what we grow. However, as you know from previous lessons, we import a lot of our food from other countries and they do genetically modify. So the chances are you are eating genetically modified food. Um, OK. So what I'd like you to do is listen to the clip, as you can see there with the link. And again, I want you to describe how it works to increase increase food supply and list the potential advantages and disadvantages. You could add these advantages and disadvantages onto your previous table by just ruling off um, and writing a new little subtitle of biotechnology and adding in there. So pause this slide, do that activity and then move on. Next strategy is using technology to boost food production. But it's important that you understand what we mean by technology because it has to be appropriate to the people that are using it. And when we think of technology, these are some of the things that might spring to your mind. So laptops, um, mobile phones, tablets, uh, music systems, games, different software component, components, robots, the internet, Bluetooth, all of these things we consider technology, you know, technology in your kitchen, like uh, fridges, freezers, washing machines, dishwashers, things that require power and have been made by or invented by very clever people to make our lives easier. And to an extent, that is what technology is. Technology is science or knowledge put into practical use to solve problems or invent useful tools. That's what technology is. All of these things you can see are high technology. They require a lot of knowledge and they require energy. And if they break, somebody needs to be able to fix them so that we can continue to use them. Let's look at farming technology because that's what we're focusing on. Again, these are examples of high technology for farming technology. Some of those things on, the, on these images, I can't even tell you what they are. We've got the sprinkler system at the top right. I'm not quite sure what the photo on the top left is. It's some sort of, uh, you know, gadget that's that's doing a job and doesn't even require a person. It looks like it's solar powered. It's some sort of robot. Um, same with the image on the middle left as well. That's not being worked by people. It's obviously some sort of robotic. Uh, so is the picture in the middle. This could all be the future of farming and, you know, in the future. Uh, middle right, same again, we've got something that's airborne there, uh, watering the land. Bottom picture, the combine harvester, uh, we're a bit more familiar with those. 
and aeroponics and hydroponics, as talked about previously, on the bottom right. But these are all really, really high tech pieces of equipment. They cost thousands and thousands of pounds to buy. So when we talk about trying to boost food production, although this might be appropriate for really rich countries where you've got people farming on a massive scale and the money to invest in this kind of technology, if you're talking about a farmer in a rural area of a, a low income country that earns, you know, 50 pounds a year, they're never going to be able to afford this kind of technology. So when we talk about using technology to boost food production, we have to talk about appropriate technology. And um, this is appropriate technology. So your title for this section is appropriate technology. The pictures here, I, I really like these ideas. The, the one on the top left is, uh, and um, the bottom left is showing you something called a hippo roller. Um, and as you're aware, people in rural areas of Africa um, don't have running water supplies. And obviously they need water. They need it for drinking, cooking, cleaning, but more importantly, they need it for irrigation for, for their crops. And water is heavy. and these people can spend a huge percentage of their time every single day going to collect water from a river that might be 10 or 15 kilometers away. Um, in our language, that's about uh, six or seven miles away. Um, for you people living in Carlton, that's, that's going into Nottingham city centre and back, and then going back again, and then back again, and then maybe one more time. That's the distance that they're walking to get water. And water's really heavy. So that hippo roller is an amazing idea. It's a barrel that they fill up with water, but then they connect it to that, simply to that metal handle, and then they can just roll it along. It's so easy, even children can do it, as shown by the picture at the bottom. Um, so it's a really good way of getting water. Now that's technology, isn't it? Because it's a piece of equipment which is making somebody's life easier. It's solving a problem. The problem is carrying water. Water is heavy. Um, it's allowing them to get a much bigger amount of water in one go and get it back home without breaking their backs and their arms. So it's still technology, but it's appropriate. The picture on the right at the top is showing you a nut sheller. Not quite sure how it works, but I presume that um, that person turns the handle around and it takes the, the shell off the nut Again, it's better than sitting there doing it by hand, hand picking them. The one on the bottom right is also a nut sheller. No, it's not. It's a coffee bean grinder. It takes the, the, the husk off the coffee beans. Um, essentially, he's put the coffee beans in that trough that you can see, and he's riding a bike, and it takes the shell off. The small picture at the very bottom is, is kind of showing you coming out the bottom. They look yellow, almost looks like they're dribbling out the bottom. Well, that's what the coffee looks like without the husk on. Um, and again, it, it's a brilliant piece of technology. And for the farmer who grows coffee, not only does it mean that he's, he's able to take the shell off, but it means that he's actually able to um, dry them out in the sun and roast them and then sell them at a higher price because it's not the same as the raw, the raw coffee. It's actually been slightly processed. So in doing that, it actually add, adds value. Um, so these are just small examples of appropriate technology and a way of boosting food production. But to summarize, people often assume that technology is always about shiny new things, but all technology exists in a context and what works in the big cities isn't necessarily appropriate for people living in poor rural areas without the same services or support. Appropriate technology includes ideas that are appropriate for a country's level of development. Technology needs to be cheap, workable and fixable for these people when it goes wrong. There is a definition in red for appropriate technology. Um, it says that it's one that's suited to the needs, skills, resources, wealth and knowledge of the people who live in a local area for the environment in which they live. I'd like to copy out that definition, please. That's your first task. And then watch the YouTube clip that you can see there and do those three things. One, 
explain what appropriate technology is, two, say how it boosts food supply, and three, why it's appropriate for poorer areas. Pause this slide, do that, and then move on to the last strategy. The last strategy to look at is the new green revolution. Before we talk about the new green revolution, though, you probably need to know about the original green revolution. Uh, the bullet point there tells you all about it. The term green revolution was first used in the 1950s and 60s. It described farming using modern techniques such as using machines, chemicals and new strains of plants in order to boost food production in poorer areas of the world. So this was to try and avoid starvation. The new green revolution, however, aims to continue to boost food production, but in a more sustainable way, because that was what was lacking in the original green revolution, is that ideas were introduced and whilst they were good and they boosted food production, they were also quite harmful to the environment and they could be quite harmful to some of the local communities in poorer countries because it used technology that wasn't appropriate, for example. So the new green revolution is more is, is an attempt to be more sustainable. So it's better for the environment and it's also better for the people. So it's about doing things in an appropriate way. So um, using irrigation, like we said, the drip irrigation, things that they can control and manage and fix if they break using biotechnology to make crops resistant to pests and to Im improve the yield that they can give and the nutritional value that they can give. In fact, you can even grow crops that have medicinal purposes. So when um, the local people eat them, it actually gives them immunity against certain diseases. So things like that are really, really beneficial. Um, it looks at trying to harvest water um, and to manage soil so that the soil doesn't get eroded. Because with the original Green Revolution, like I say, it was environmentally damaging and it led to um, problems with soil erosion because the farmers didn't necessarily understand how to farm in a way that protected and conserved the environment. So the new Green Revolution is um, an improvement, if you like, to the original one. It's trying to do the same thing, which is boost food production, but focusing a little bit more on doing it in a, so, in a sustainable way, which is better for the people and better for the environment. Finish today's lesson. I'd like you to have a go at a six mark question. So you should spend um, about eight minutes on it, no more than. The question is, explain how food security can be improved. Now, you've just looked at about six strategies. I suggest you don't try and talk about all six. You might pick your three favourite, say how they work, how they can boost food production and how that ultimately can boost food security. If you need some guidance and you want to see the mark scheme, here it is. I'm not going to talk through all of that, but you can pause the slide and have a little look at what you've got to do to get maximum marks. And I have written in bullet points some guidance down the right hand side of the things that you should perhaps talk about. But like I say, don't try and talk about all of them. You don't need to for six marks. For six marks, it's about detail. It's not about the amount you write. It's about the quality of what you write. So you'd be better off talking about a couple of the ideas that we have learnt about today, uh, describing them in detail, explaining how they work and how they boost production. Pause the video now for the answers on Senegal irrigation. Pause the video now for the answers on aeroponics and hydroponics. Pause the video now for the answers on biotechnology. Pause the video now for the answers on appropriate technology.